I have to say that as a Latin American, um, I'm always happy to be in other parts of our continent, but at the same time I'm always very sad when I realize how much opportunities we are losing but not actually interacting more in academic and scientific terms. So I think that's uh, something that one should keep in mind. What um, I would like to uh, do today is to share with you some ideas, not only on the actual origin of life, which is indicated here, but I would really like to underline the idea of prebiotic evolution. Because um, when, as a biologist, you look at the possibilities of life, not only uh, understanding how it arose in the, in, on the earth, but how it may arise elsewhere, something that I have to confess I'm quite, quite a skeptical, one has to realize that it's a very important to emphasize that the appearance of life is not a sudden phenomenon. In other words, um, regardless of the fact that you can have uh, planets, that doesn't mean that you will go directly from non-living matter to life. You can have water that is not enough to go directly from non-living matter to life. You can have organic compounds, a very complex set of organic compounds, that will not take you directly to life. The current evolutionary thinking of most biologists, of most life scientists, is that in fact there was a slow, not necessarily uh, stepwise, transition from the non-living matter to actual living matter. So that's the basic point I want, I would like to emphasize today. The other point is that most of our current ideas are derived in one way or the other from the proposal made first in 1924, then in 1936, translated into English in 1938 by Alexander Ivanovich Oparin, who was a, a life scientist that quite boldly for his time, decided to speak with astronomers, with planetologists, with geophysicists, with chemists, and so on, and came to the conclusion that it was impossible to assume from a Darwinian perspective that life appeared all of a sudden. So he actually uh, started uh, realizing that if you want to have a life, you need organic compounds. If you're going to have organic compounds, then you need to, to synthesize and accumulate them. At the time, people were already much aware that hydrogen was the most abundant element in the universe, so that meant that synthetic chemistry uh, involving carbon was feasible, and then relying on the very rich German, basically, tradition of organic synthetic chemistry, he, he came to the conclusion that that had been the uh, formation of organic compounds, what we call now uh, the primitive soup, and because he was relying on pre-Mendelian genetics, he was one of those, half of the world at the time was not fully aware of the role of uh, genes in chromosomes and so on, he came to the conclusion that, in fact, the entire protoplasm, which is a term we don't use anymore, was actually involved in the uh, reproduction, division of cells, proposed quasurbates as a pre-cellular model, and from the evolution of these quasurbates, you eventually get to anaerobic, is, that is not oxygen requiring, heterotrophic, that, that is not photosynthetic bacteria. In other words, the first living beings according to this scheme with prokaryotes, uh, or cells that lack a uh, nuclear membrane, uh, that was the original definition, they were nourishing themselves from the same organic material from which they had been formed, and that were living in a an highly anaerobic uh, environment, which is quite consistent, I have to say, with what we see today in extant biochemistry. Well, um, the idea was proposed in 1936 uh, in a very elaborate form, translated into English in 1938. There were very difficult times for the world, uh, for any practical uh, reasons the Second World War had already started, and it was not until the Second World War that the people became actually very actively engaged in trying to uh, assess this possibility under laboratory conditions. And all of you know that the first successful experiment trying to study the origins of life was the Miller experiment when he was 22 years old, working under the direction of a very well-known cosmochemist, Harold Urey, an extraordinary man by all accounts. And uh, Stanley Miller did a very simple experiment uh, in which he had this flask with methane, water, uh, vapor, ammonia and hydrogen was subject for one week uh, to electric discharges and in actually just a few hours you can see how the inside of the apparatus changes chemically. Uh, um, the experiment um, 
the original apparatus was thrown away by Stanley Miller. It ended up in the trash bin of the chemistry department of the Chicago University. Several of us asked him many times, why did you do so? And said, well, it was very complicated to clean. So the, that was the end of the, the apparatus. Um, but he left very detailed, he left very detailed instructions, so very detailed description of how the experiment had been performed. And uh, it can be repeated without any problem, as in this case, uh, on the right side of the screen, there was a repetition made by my friend and colleague William Schoff at UCLA. Um, the problem uh, with this, well not the problem, the point that I want to emphasize with this uh, experiment is not only that it was a very inexpensive experiment, it uh, by modern standards, it was probably no more than $1,200 instead of these big science projects that have transformed many researchers into administrators and not into scholars. And, but the other point that I would like to emphasize is that, as you can see here, it's, I, I use the title One Pot Model Prebiotic uh, uh, Chemistry Experiment. In other words, you put all the things together in the same vessel and see what happens. And what happened, we know well, was the synthesis of about 22 different different organic compounds that we were able to synthesize uh, in very detailed manner a few years ago. Um, and the experiment was absolutely successful. Now, how can we compare? How can we actually know that what we are doing, what Stanley Miller was performing, uh, makes sense in terms of the chemistry of the early solar system? Well, we have uh, meteorites. And uh, here you see uh, the outcome of a comparison of aliphatic amino acids, something that we performed at the lab of Jeff Beda together with um, uh, Danny Glavin, which is in the audience, a very dear friend and colleague. And you can see the excellent correlation in between the amino acids that are synthesized in this one pot experiment, a Miller-like experiment, you see the excellent correlation in terms of the amount and the composition of the of a mixture of aliphatic amino acids from the Murchison meteorite, which is a 4.6 cent to the nine years old meteorite. So one pot experiments can be extremely successful. This was done historically. This is a very good comparison uh, in terms of uh, having a material that comes from the early stages of the solar system, uh, early evolutionary stages of the chemistry of the solar system. But one can actually perform this kind of one pot experiment if you put all the things together in one single vessel. And this is a recently published experiment by uh, Ram Krishnamurti, an excellent chemist working also in La Jolla. And you can see that he decided to use a very simple compound, which is the amido phosphate, quite reasonable in terms of prebiotic chemistry. And if you have nucleosides, or you have a few amino acids, or you have glycerol fatty acids, and you put them together, you mix them with the amino phosphate, you get nucleotides, activated amino acids, and lipids, and you go right away to oligonucleotides, peptides, and vesicles. Vesicles meaning either liposomes or micelles, and so on, that actually simulate what we can do with other mixtures of these uh, phospholipid or lipidic compounds. In other words, one pot experiments work and they work extremely well. Why am I emphasizing this? Because there's, um, from here, one can actually come to the conclusion that our model of the primitive earth, regardless of its simplicity, actually works. Um, we have gone from these global models of the primitive atmosphere to recognize the role of microenvironments. We can have, we can picture small ponds, or some people prefer actually the hydrothermal vents environments. I'm not so keen on the hydrothermal vents and chemistry environments, I have to say that. A number of biologists are not so keen on that as a site for the origins of life. But regardless of the fact, we know that there were many sources of volatile, uh, volatiles in the primitive earth coming either from volcanoes volcanic eruptions coming you know, inbound in comets, asteroids, meteorites, and so on. You can have local synthesis. And the overall picture that we have is that you can have a, the so-called primitive soup with amino acids, nucleobases, sugars, lipids, and so on. And this is a metaphor. One should keep in mind that the term primitive soup is just a metaphor. Some people may argue that it's better to have the compounds from meteorites or from the electric discharges or from uh, hydrothermal vents. I have a very eclectic uh, perspective about how you can cook the primitive soup. Mexican cuisine, Mexican gastronomy, Chinese gastronomy, Indian gastronomy are very good, are very sophisticated, because we never despise any source of organic compounds. Um, if you really want to have a good 
hearty and nourishing soup, you use everything that's available. And I don't see why we should just concentrate on one particular source of organic compounds or one particular source of energy to synthesize the chemicals you need or you require for cooking the soup. That having said, uh, the fact is that there's now a current debate, a very intense debate going on in the Origins of Life community, which I'm sure most of my uh, uh, colleagues from astronomy, geophysics, and so on are not aware, which is a different approach based on system chemistry. And one of the most outspoken, intelligent, articulated uh, defenders of uh, this idea is John Sutherland, now at Cambridge and in the English Cambridge. Uh, and his basic idea is that because you cannot get all the compounds that you need to actually simulate properly a primitive soup, perhaps in the primitive uh, environment there were uh, one should think of uh, various subsystems, one that will synthesize nucleotides, one that will synthesize sugars, and one that will synthesize amino acids, and trying to connect these subsystems in one way or the other. And he and his colleagues have devised a number of uh, model experiments that I will talk about briefly, and tried to demonstrate that you can actually connect these different chemical subsystems using intermediates and or byproducts to, to, to link them. And then from these results, try to infer the more or less what may have been the primitive conditions prior to the evolution of Earth, and then try to assess other chemical consequences of the inferred scenario. And let me give you an example of the kind of problems that we have if we go to the traditional uh, one-part approach. Uh, if we do so, for instance, let us say that we want to synthesize abiotically. Abiotically doesn't mean necessarily prebiotically. It doesn't mean that our model is fully consistent with what we know of the primitive earth. Let us assume we try to synthesize ribonucleotides. These are essential components of, of RNA, DNA, of a number of cofactors in modern biochemistry and so on. And this is the case of citidine. And you can see here the nucleobase. Here you can see the pyrimidine. You see the sugar. It's a close uh, uh, form of the sugar, and you see the phosphate. Fair enough. Typically, in the traditional perspective, what we will do was will be to mix all of them together, the different components, uh, put them in water, evaporate the water, or use what we call a condensing agent, but then we rapidly face a number of problems. They are actually very serious. It's very difficult to form this chemical bond under such conditions. It's equally complicated to form the bond between phosphate and the sugar. So we have been desperating about uh, this approach for, for many years, for at least 10 or 12 years. Some people have a more optimistic uh, perspective about this. Some of us are quite uh, skeptical. But then John Sutherland and one of his younger colleagues, uh, Matt Prohner, decided to actually go to a uh, prebiotic synthesis in terms of system chemistry. And what they did was actually uh, synthesize very rapidly using glycohaldehyde and cyanamide. Um, they actually demonstrated that you could form quite easily in the presence of glyceraldehyde. They could form the pentose, these five uh, carbon sugar you see here, with amino oxaline. It was a very abundant product. And then Instead of going in the traditional approach, which as you can see here, fails in, in a very miserable way most of the time, they actually went uh, added cyanoacetylene, and then they produced this compound. Chemists are very fond, like geologists, of very complex name, and anhydroarabinose nucleosides, and then they added the phosphate, and then you get the activated citidine. A very successful experiment. But one has to say, and I'm not criticizing this, I'm just describing the situation, that instead of cooking all the things together, you actually use one pot to put one of the components, which will be this one, and then you take the products and go to another pot and use the other component, and then you go to another pot and add the other component, and then you uh, go to another pot and add the phosphate. Fair enough. You have... Uh, in the meantime, you have changed pH, you have changed the concentration of cofactors, you have changed, a, you have added different components to fulfill the reaction, but the reaction is very successful. Now, this kind of uh, model of prebiotic chemistry requires a very convoluted prebiotic scenario that I'm not going to describe in detail, but you have to picture that you have meteoritic fragments in the, in the sediments, then, then you add different components, then you have evaporation, and then you have the coming together of the components via streams or rivers and so on. 
So you see that in one case we have a very simple experiment in which we put all the things together. In the other, you work like a French or a Chinese cook, actually adding the ingredients in a proper manner in different times. And this has led to what I think is an unfortunate um, uh, perspective about uh, discussion on prebiotic chemistry. One of the major, major achievements, without any doubt, about the John Sutherland system chemistry approach is that you can actually demonstrate from a very simple mixture of organic compounds, but always going from one part to the other. Don't forget that. I mean, it's a very elaborate cooking of the, of the uh, organic compounds. You can have amino acid precursors, nucleoside precursors, you can have lipidic precursors, all at the same time. Fair enough. But the discussion is actually quite intense. It's one of those discussions that uh, it remains unseen to a number of uh, colleagues from other fields. But let me put it this way. Some will call them two opposing ways of modeling prebiotic chemistry. I'm not quite sure that they are truly opposing. I brought opposing and I brought the question mark because I think there's a way to reconcile these two perspectives. So in the miller urey one pot laboratory simulations, we have a very successful synthesis of amino acids, hydroxy acids, purines, sugars, and so on. In the system chemistry experimental approach, you have the synthesis of precursors of ribonucleotides, amino acids, lipid, lipids, linked through cyanosulfidic chemistry. Here you have a high energy, non-selective chemistry. Here you have low energy processes, and you are Relying on the inher in inherent reactivity, chemical reactivity of the different compounds you are forming. Here you can have a just one step production of single class of bio biomolecules at the time, mostly, together with some additional compounds and very, very complex uh, polymer material that it's very difficult to analyze under laboratory conditions. You can break your uh, head really uh, trying to understand the components that you have here and the structure, the composition and so on. Here you have a multipot experimental model of simultaneously interacting chemical subsistence, but you have the involvement of non-prebiotic reactants, and you require truly unrealistic hydrogen sulfide and several metallic cations uh, concentrations. I have no problems with that. I think that here we are actually looking at the demonstration that other chemistries are feasible. And I think that in the long run, or in the short run, we will be able to reconcile by both points of views. But my idea uh, right now is to convey to you the fact that there is a division of, uh, among those working in prebiotic chemistry. There are some uh, intellectual animosities, and that one should remember what Henry Kissinger once said. The worst, uh, um, encounters you can see are at the university level because there are so very few things to gain. But uh, having that in mind, keep uh, also an eye to the possibility that these things may not be so different as uh, people would like to think of. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will come to a reasonable conclusion. Okay. So both ideas, both approaches rely on the formation of the, on the primitive soup. So remember that the primitive soup as such is a metaphor. It's a very useful metaphor, but it's like Schrodinger cat. It's like Maxwell Demon. Metaphors are very useful in science, but can also be intellectually very risky. OK, but what about the primitive soup? Must have been a very a bewildering organic chemical wonderland, but it did not include all the compounds of molecular structures in extant life forms. Some people think that, well, perhaps there was already some protoform of transfer RNA or some protoform of uh, ribosomes floating in the primitive soup. That's impossible. From a biological, from an evolutionary perspective, that's not feasible. Clearly, evolvability was limited by physical and chemical constraints. Not all the components of the primitive soup were equally reactive. Not all the components were formed at the same time. Not all the components were uh, actually uh, were actually uh, available to, to react. In the absence of hereditary material, physical and chemical complexes must have played a role in the origins of life. For instance, the interaction of organic compounds with minerals. We know they can concentrate, in some cases, organic compounds. But current biology indicates that life could have not evolved in the absence of a genetic replicating material, ensuring the stability and diversification of its basic components. And because of its catalytic and replicative abilities, our best candidate for this is RNA. Now, most of the people in the audience, I'm sure that were educated with the idea that RNA was an intermediate in the synthesis of proteins in the so-called centric dogma by uh, Francis Crick. Well, 
uh, there was a huge discussion, even with some political and ideological uh, uh, aspects, during many, many years about what came first, DNA or proteins. And we are now, uh, most of us are preferred to choose as our candidate for coming first, RNA. Now, RNA as a nucleic acid, was never thought at school as something having catalytic activities. We know now otherwise. We can actually see that every single catalytic activity that you see in the different enzymes, like oxyreductases, transferases, hydrolases, and so on, is also an activity that we find in ribozymes in catalytic RNA. So the spectrum of catalytic activity of RNA is indeed quite broad something sometimes realized under laboratory conditions, sometimes found in nature. But what is fascinating is when you look actually at the properties of RNA. It's not only a catalyst, it's, it's a major player in extant biology. In fact, if you want to have RNA, you, have, you need to have ribonucleotides. The biosynthesis of, bi of ribonucleotides is the same in all living systems. That means it's monophyletic, it's a very ancient trait that appeared quite early in cellular evolution. And once you have RNA, you can have known code, you can have coding RNA, like in the messenger's RNA in our own cells, like in the influenza virus, for instance. You can have RNAs that are actually known coding, but have a, play a key role in regulation. We can have large known coding RNA, like in the ribosomal RNA. And uh, we can actually have, if we want to have DNA, we need to have ribonucleotides. It's impossible biologically not to have uh, a, 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 the oxyribonucleotides in the absence of ribonucleotides. So clearly, RNA is not only a, cata a catalyst, it plays truly a key, key role in many biological activities. And in my own lab, we have been concentrated on the evolutionary history of coenzymes, histidine, alarmones, and antibiotics, which are ribonucleotides can be modified, and they can give rise to cyclic adenosine monophosphate, which is a second messenger that you see both intracellular or extracellular-like. Histidine, which is the most abundant amino acid in the catalytic side of enzymes. You can have coenzymes, like flavin adenine dinucleotide, without which enzymes rarely have any activity. And you can also have some antibiotics that were probably actually came late in evolution. So what is the RNA world? I think there are many possible definitions of the RNA world, but one could say that it's a, the, the catalytic, regulatory, and structural properties of RNA molecules and ribonucleotides, combined with their ubiquity in cellular processes, suggest that it's an early, perhaps primordial stage during which RNA molecules play a much more obvious, conspicuous role in heredity and metabolism. And even if you don't accept this possibility, you have to explain in biological terms how did RNA and ribonucleotides came to play su such a key role in X and biological process. So this has changed our perspective about the origins of life. I think it's fair to say that we now prefer the idea of synthesis and accumulation of organic compounds, not necessarily in a highly reducing atmosphere. We recognize the RNA world as an intermediate between these two and excellent living cells. But one should keep in mind that we have very big question marks on how to go from the primitive soup to the RNA world and from the RNA world into extant cells. And because of that, I would like almost to end, almost, almost, with a quotation from Alan Schwartz, the, a very dear friend and colleague with a tremendous experience on the origins of life that uh, wrote recently that the increasing number of discoveries of extrasolar planets has certainly changed the game to some extent. But one wonder if our optimists should become so inflated as long as research in life origin has not been yet able to establish a convincing prebiotic and truly plausible scenario for the synthesis of the first RNA uh, conditions. In other words, as a biologist, be very careful about your uh, speculations and extrapolations about the primitive Earth or the current planet to life in other places. So let me end with this. I think that the search for extraterrestrial life is high on speculation and poor and low on fact. We are almost, in this case, like theologians. Uh, so we have certainly the diversity and abundance of extraterrestrial organic compounds, the robustness of abiotic synthesis and is of formation of molecular, polymolecular systems is quite established. We know that there is a rapid uh, origin of life on Earth. Some people will argue that the early Martian conditions were conducive to the origins of life. And indeed, we have many solar type stars and extrasolar planetary systems. But what I always like to say is that extraterrestrial life is like democracy. 
everybody speaks about it, nobody has really seen it. Thank you very much. Okay.